Hi, I'm your host, Didi Chang. Audio Builders TV presents Studio Design with Lou Clark. Lou sat down with CCHS student Chris Sakanda for an in-depth interview. Lou has over 30 years of experience as a studio designer. You'll find his designs all over New England and in some prestigious facilities throughout the United States. Audio Builders TV is produced by the students of Concord Carlisle High School with help from Colonial Sound and CCTV. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and subscribe to our mailing list at audiobuildersworkshop.com. <laughs> Audio Builders. Audio Builders Workshop is a work group for the Boston chapter of the Audio Engineering Society. So Lou, I have a studio at home that I'm building currently. Uh, why would I need to treat it in the first place? Um, what would be the main purpose of that? What would I gain from that? You want to make a neutral space. That's what we're after. Uh, we always talk about the good sounding rooms. We don't, we don't want good. We don't want good sounding speakers. Uh, we don't want a good sounding room. We want neutral speakers, neutral room. So flat, you know, we, talk, we were talking earlier about flat speakers. Right. We want to try to do the same thing relatively to the room. We want to flatten it out um, within reason. And this is important because we want to hear what the artists have developed. They, they created this sound stage for you. They created music, maybe spoken word. Um, that's, they want you to hear that in a certain way and the room is going to impart its own characteristics into what they created. So we want to remove that. Um, and that's, that's what we're after, neutral sounding spaces. Okay, awesome. Um, can you show us or give us some examples of how to do that or, you know, sure. yeah, anything? I have a, a topology I work from. Um, okay. So there's certain elements that we work from. We control bass, um, reflections, diffusion, all that sort of thing. So I have kind of a, a standard way of thinking about the space, and I just kind of move through it that way and solve all the issues that we're dealing with um, regarding the room. Yeah, awesome. Could you talk about that a little bit? I can. So after you've set up your symmetry, right. um, you're going to set up the speakers in an equilateral triangle. And what that is is it's 60 degrees. It's a 60-degree it's a triangle, so each corner is like that. So the distance that the speakers are apart is how far away you are from the speaker. Okay. So you've lined yourself up in the middle of the room the way you need to. Now you spread the speakers and you have the equilateral triangle. Okay. And you're gonna sit in that triangle. Yeah, so is there anything about how high the speakers need to be? Anything like that? Yes, um, ear height. Fairly basic concept, very often missed. Um, we wanna hear the sound stage in front of us. That's how we exist in the world, that's how we, we know the world. So when you set up the speakers, you put them, if, if, you know, if you're four feet up, your ear height is four feet, that's where you set the speakers. And maybe a little higher, you can get away with, um, but not much. Okay. So what is, what is the position that a person would need to be in to hear the best possible sound that they could hear with the setup they have? So once you're in that equilateral triangle, you need to set up a desk, because you're gonna be working at a desk the point of that triangle is going to be 18 inches back from the front of your desk. Okay. And your head's going to be in that space. And we don't put our head in a vise and, exactly. you know, we don't do that sort of a thing. Right. Um, so you're going to kind of float in that space. Um, and again, about 18 inches, and that'll put you, so the triangle is behind your head. And now you have equilateral, triangle behind your head, and now you sit in that space. And it's the difference between listening to the speakers and listening to the music. Okay. As you walk away from that triangle, the speaker sound is going to collapse. So now you're just listening to speakers. But once you get into this position, now you listen to the sound stage, what the artist created. Okay. Awesome. So um, what are some things that you could possibly do if maybe you don't have, maybe you have a room already and um, you can't really change the size of it, shape of it, or perhaps like um, you have a very small space for speakers. Does it matter how, um, if the speakers are closer together, um, would it be the same principle if you use the, pr the equilateral triangle? No matter how close or far away each other, you'd still get the same sound? You're still after the same thing, yeah. Okay. No matter how far away, how close, 
you're all trying to always trying to accomplish the same thing okay so um, can you talk about um, tilting the speaker does it have to be um, if you if you have some limitations that you'd come across um, is there anything you have to do to tilt the speaker down tilt it up anything like that uh, you don't want to tilt it down if you can avoid it okay um, because what that means is you've put the speaker up high. The higher you get it, the more the desk that you're sitting in front of becomes a problem. And it's called console bounce. So there's a reflection that's going to come off of that, that desk that is going to change the sound of what you're hearing. Okay. So the higher that speaker gets, the more that happens. So it's better to you know, keep you, it down to your level. Yeah. Can you explain what a reflection is? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so sound is going to come out of the speaker right. and it's going to go from the speaker to your ear but it's also going to go off to the sides it's going to bounce off of a surface and come to your ear uh, that's a reflection and the, the distance is going to be different and that's what's important so the reflection is going to come to you later than the original sound did and this is what we hear is echoes yeah. as reverb um, the sound of a room that's what it is it's all these reflections kind of. Okay. Would that be the most um, problematic thing that you'd face probably in a room that you're trying to build? It's the most problematic thing. Okay. That's the problem with the room yeah. is all the reflections. So how would you create equal reflections or make it um, symmetrical like you mentioned before? Do you have to, what like precautions would you take or what would you, how would you start doing that? So it's part of the symmetry thing again. Right. We want the reflections on the left side to equal the same as the right side. And that's equal reflections. And we're going to move the, the sound around the room. We're going to try to move it away from the listener initially, and then it'll come back later. So that, that time delay, as we call the, the time gap, is what we're after. And so if, if we do it on the left, we've got to do it on the right. And we can use absorption, we can use reflection, and we can use diffusion. Absorption means we're going to take the sound away. It absorbs. Reflection meaning it's going to bounce somewhere. And diffusion is scattering. So we're going to take the sound and, and scatter it in all kinds of directions. And that way you don't hear it as a discrete echo. Okay. Um, so we want to do it the same on both sides. And a lot of times rooms, as I'm sure you know, aren't the same on the left and right. You may have a window on the left side and no window on the right side. Um, and in this particular... Uh, room to the bottom of the, the drawing you see there is a that's a sliding glass door right so and on the right side which is the top of the drawing there's nothing so we get a strong reflection off of this sliding glass door but not a reflection off the other side so how do we make it so that they're equal we put a curtain in front of the, the sliding glass door so now it absorbs just like the other side of the room that kind of comes back into um, tilting your speakers, are you still going to want to make them as level as you possibly can um, yes. with your ears, like yep. with the tweeter, right? Yeah, and again, it's that, that sound stage. We exist in the world the way we do. We're used to being however tall we are off the ground, and we hear sound that way. Right. Um, to lift the speakers high up in the air or put them on the floor, it just sounds unnatural to us, so even in a home theater. So the better, it, the, better the tweeter is leveled with your ears, the better you'll hear sound in general the more natural it yeah, will be more natural yes it will be. i see on your slide here you have something called front wall broadband absorption can you explain that so the front of the room is prime time for bass that's where your speakers are right that's where all the energy is it really wants to build up so we need to figure out a way to to make that go away and i like to create a broadband absorber so this is going to reach all the way down in the lows all the way up to the highs. It's so you're we, EQing the room? Sort of, sort of. You, you could think of it that way. Um, you're EQing it, trying to take it away. Right. It's like we're, we're neutralizing it. Exactly. Flattening it out, so to speak. Okay. Which is never yeah. the true goal. Flat doesn't exist. It doesn't need to exist. We just need to get it in reason. Um, so up front where the speakers are is where you want to try to do it. You want to okay. absorb as much as you can up front and using... And unfortunately, bass requires a lot of space to do that. Right. Bigger the room would be the best. Yeah. Okay. And in this case, this room 
Uh, the speakers are sort of in space. They're not mounted in the wall or anything. They're, they're mounted in a trap. So a lot of insulation is how that was accomplished. And in this case, a lot of insulation. So, okay, you talked about front wall base absorption. Can you talk about rear wall space absorption? So that's the next spot. So the sound wants to travel to the back of the room. Uh, it's going to see a big surface and wants to come back. So it's the next place to absorb the base. Um, as deep as possible, as big as possible, as thick, as much insulation as possible is what we're typically after. Because um, I don't want to hear the back wall. And, and if the room's big enough, you're going to hear it as a slap echo. So you make a noise, you hear a noise later, the same thing come back at you. It's a slap echo. Uh, and we want to avoid that. Yeah, so two sounds just going back and forth. Yeah. Right. Okay, very interesting. Um, could you talk about um, diffusion at all? Like diffusion in a room, what you would need to do, anything like that? Would that be the next thing you do? Yeah, you, you don't want, what happens is we, uh, we tend to over deaden spaces. That's, that's the classic, you know, someone goes and they want to change their room. They're going to put a bunch of one inch foam up, you know, foam. Um, bad idea. Mm. You're, you're over deadening the space in the high frequencies and under deadening them in the low frequencies. So what we do is we, we create diffusion. So that way we can keep energy in the room. It doesn't get too dead, but it's not an echo because what diffusion does is it scatters sound around. So something's gonna, a sound is gonna go at it. And it doesn't matter what angle it goes at it and it'll bounce off in all kinds of different directions. So you don't actually hear it, but you sense it. So the room doesn't sound dead. And that's, that's why we do diffusion. The back wall is the most common place for it. Yeah, so um, could you still do diffusion if you have a small enough, or a if your room isn't as large as it would need to be, is it not as important as something like getting reflections out of the way or um, doing base traps, is it, you know, or is it as important, equally as important? It's just as important. Yeah. The smaller the room gets, though, the trickier that does get, because diffusion okay. can be weird to control. Um, if you get too close to a diffuser, it actually sounds funny. Oh, really? So you, you, you wouldn't want a diffuser just a couple feet behind your head. You'll actually hear it. And it, it you know, so now you're losing that neutrality in the room. Um, so you, gotta, you have to make sure that it's far enough away. Typically that's eight feet or more. Mm, okay. Uh, sometimes you can cheat and you could mount, say, a, a diffuser on the ceiling and have a reflector on the back wall. So now the sound is going to bounce off the reflector, which is aimed at the diffuser, bound up the, bounce off the diffuser. You've made the room longer. Mm. So that's a kind of a trick you can do with oh, diffusion and reflections. Can you talk about more in depth of the problem of people using one inch foam at all? Like what really is the big problem with that? Can you explain a little bit more of that? So the waves at 20 hertz are 50 feet long. It's 50 feet, it's huge. Um, but at 1000 hertz, it's 12 inches, it's one foot. So absorbers need to work within the range of that, those distances. They need to be able to absorb that energy. So by putting one inch foam, it's only effective about 1000 hertz and up. So everything below it isn't getting absorbed. So what you're putting on is a partial absorber. We want a full absorber. The energy bouncing off the wall is roughly 300 hertz and up. So the one inch foam missed 300 hertz to 1000 hertz. So we need to put things thicker. Um, mm. Typically six inches is the minimum. Mm. And As opposed to one inch, which just seems a lot thinner when you think about it. Right, it's a lot thinner. Okay. So um, I have something going on my, in my room where if I clap my hands like this, I can hear this staticky kind of um, weird sound. It goes like boing, that kind of thing. Um, can you explain that? What's what's going on with that? So you're hearing two parallel surfaces across from each other, and you make a noise, and the ec it creates echoes, and they're bouncing back and forth. Um, and they slowly die out because eventually it 
the sound gets absorbed, so it just dies away. Um, it's very noticeable. And in, in just my life, I hear it all the time. Unfortunately, when I learned how to do this kind of stuff, you hear everything now. Mm. So I'll walk in, down a hallway and I hear the boing. Um, you don't want it in your room because it's, again, it's that neutral thing. It's, so it's imparting a character. And usually it's a high frequency kind of, it, it sounds like a boing. Yeah. Um, and very simple to solve though. One inch foam usually does do it. Yeah. Um, just hanging things on the wall, um, you know, simple scattering devices, bookshelves, um, uh, hang a curtain. Uh, right. Very, very simple to get rid of. Okay, so again, normal household things that you can find. You don't really need to go out and buy stuff if you don't have the money to afford all yeah. those things. Just sometimes the stuff you have at home can work. Yeah. Great. Okay. I did a room that we used wire. So all the cables for the studio, headphones, things like that, just hung them on the wall. And, oh. and the flutter echo went away. Awesome. So we talked about the sides a lot. Um, what do we need to do to the ceiling, if anything? Is that important or not as much? Just as important. Okay. It's, it's equally as important. So we always think of the walls. We have to absorb the walls or, or diffuse walls, that sort of thing. Um, the ceiling is the same thing. Sound doesn't care what direction it's going. Where the reflections are coming, it doesn't care. If it's going to get to your ears, it's going to get to your ears. So we treat the ceiling just as we do, do a wall. Do we scatter? Do we absorb? Or do we ref reflect? And we want to make sure none of the energy from the ceiling is coming to your ears. So mm. big absorbers or, or redirections. So I have hardwood floor in my room at least, um, and I threw a rug on there because I noticed um, I was getting lots of flutter echo, very just it felt very spacey if you if you will in my room um, and when I threw a rug in there it really just completely transformed the room's sound is that a good thing was I doing something right or is that not always the case um, it's good that you have a hardwood floor actually okay. that's a great place to start that's always my recommendation to, for the floor to actually be hard whether it be concrete or some kind of vinyl or hardwood you know etc they're all fine Never wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Mm. Um, putting a throw rug is fine. That's actually perfectly fine to do. You can move it out if you need to, if it's too dead. Um, but to eliminate that flutter echo, rather than throw a rug down, I would do something to the ceiling. Uh, okay. It's a better place to do it. And I would do something thick. So the problem with the carpet is it's extremely thin. So it's right. only absorbing maybe 5,000 hertz and up. So now you're putting Again, an low. absorber that's not doing enough work, it's going to start to make the room feel dead in the highs and liver in the lows. And you don't want that. You want it equal. So you have to be careful with carpets. But they're fine to throw down for, you know, ambience because uh, people are cozy with a rug. Right. So for the desk itself, would you need to um, make, is there anything or any factor that you would need to think about when doing it is there do you need to change a desk if you have something else or anything about the desk that could possibly affect the acoustic sound in the room yeah they they have a big effect on it so we we like to use the furniture to control the acoustics also we have to think about that because you're going to have potentially a reflection bouncing off the desk into your ears uh, and you want to eliminate that and in this slide um, it shows the height, and it's, you can see that the speaker in the slide is around the height of the ear. So we accomplished that. But then we also have the angled racks. So these racks were tilted so that when sound hits the back of the rack, it bounces up into the ceiling, which is absorptive. Mm. Yeah, because um, if you already are having that um, absorption on the ceiling, um, you'll save a lot of, you'll actually make this the room even more neutral. Right. Okay. Very interesting. So we're utilizing the ceiling to absorb the sound coming off of the desk and keeping it away from the mixer's ear, the recording engineer's ear. Uh, what's the best kind of stand to have for speakers in general? Would you need um, just speaker stands or a wall mounts better? Can you explain that? So the best thing is to keep it off the wall. Okay. Um, that can be a tricky thing. So it's better to have the stand uh, be very heavy, 
we want a very heavy stand. Uh, and in this slide, we used cinder block. Oh, okay. Very heavy, very inexpensive too. Right. Um, and you also want to decouple, what we call decouple the speaker from the structure. And what that means is kind of disconnect it. Um, and in this case, we put rubber pucks underneath the speaker. So now the speaker's a little bit bouncy on top of a very heavy stand. And what this does is it prevents the, the speaker from putting sound down through the floor. Okay. Because we don't want to move the floor. Because now it's, again, it's something that's going to change the sound of the room. If the floor is moving, that means it's making sound, it's making noise. We want to prevent that. By mounting a speaker on the wall, you're actually putting it on a surface that's going to now make its own sound. And you don't want to do that. It's going to vibrate the whole wall and re-radiate sound. And we want to prevent that. So I've seen some of your work in terms of um, the studios that you've designed. And I actually can't see the speakers in most of them. What, um, why is that? So it's, it's a little trick, I guess, I like to do in a room. Uh, if the client will let me. Um, hiding the speakers. If you, we, we always hear with our eyes. It's very common. We're, we're just, you know, if we have sight, we're just more used to using it. So we will hear with them. So if I see a speaker on the right, I can associate sound coming out of it, whether it's, you know, dead center on the speaker or not. Um, by hiding the speaker, you lose track of where it is. So you actually start to listen to the sound field, to the sound stage. Um, depth, you can hear depth when you're listening to speakers. You can hear how far something is. Um, and you can hear whether it's left or right or in the center. So hiding the speaker just becomes this psychological, it, it, you let go of you know, what you're seeing. Mm. And you just start listening to the sound field. So it's a little trick I like to do. And you need to use special fabrics to do that. You can't just go hang anything in front of it. Um, we call it acoustically transparent. So it's going to be very thin. Um, so it won't affect the hertz that the speaker is putting out. Exactly, because we don't want to change what the speaker is doing. Okay. And you don't want to put something in front of it that's going to start absorbing the sound coming out of it. So it's going to be very thin. Um, and that's really the only criteria, just making sure that that fabric is thin enough to do that. And you basically put a screen in front of the speaker. Mm. And I've done a lot of listening where it's there and not there. We will, we'll, you know, we'll pop the screen off and do some listening and then pop the screens back on and listen. And, and you, it does change how you think about it. Whether it's cha actually changing what you're hearing, I don't think it is. So where's the best place for a person to be sitting in the room? So again, we go back to the equilateral triangle. We've set all that stuff up. Um, the, the speakers are spaced properly. We're symmetrical in the room. We're in the center. Um, but we're in the center of one of the dimension, and that's the width. Um, we don't want to be in the center of the length of the room. That's a bad place to be. Um, so what we do is we set ourselves up 38% from the front wall. And when I say the front wall, I mean the speaker's side of the room. Um, so you want to be, if it's a 10-foot deep room, that's you know, roughly three foot eight ish. Um, so 38% is a, it's a rule of thumb. We call it, it's not the, a rule, it's not a law, um, but it, it, it tends to be the best place to sit and listen to the, the sound. And that's because of room modes. Um, so all this sound is building up in the low frequencies. And if you're sitting in the center of the room in both axes, you're basically in a spot that there could be no sound. Um, the speaker could be producing 100 hertz and you can't even hear it. Or it could be louder than it, it's actually coming out of the speaker. It can actually amplify. So by going 38% into the space, those things tend to not happen. So we can actually hear the speakers as they're, they're meant to be. So what are the different types of ways you can mount a speaker in a room? So we have four major ways to do it. We can mount it on a stand, very common. Everyone knows about that. Um, we can put it in a soffit. We can put it in a flush mounted system. Or we could do a, what I call base mounted, a, a trap mounted. Um, 
It's kind of a, you know, not really a way as far as the world is concerned. It's just something I do, which works out pretty well. And it's, it's a combination of using the base trapping and stand mount um, and, and just taking advantage of that. So that, that's the, the four types that we do. Stand, soffit, flush, and base trap mounted. Could you describe stand mounts? So a stand mount is going to be the most common. Uh, could be even the desk. A lot of times people will put it on a desk, the speakers on a desk. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages. Um, I find it, it's just the easiest to work with. Uh, it's flexible. A lot of times people are going to have to move things around. Uh, they're going to have to get to things behind. Um, they, so they have access to everything. It's not the best way to mount them in a room. Um, it's just the most common, and it's it's the problem with all the low frequencies again. Um, so, so the low frequencies are the ones that cause the most trouble. Yes. Seems like okay. And doing it this way doesn't really solve any of those. Uh, there's there's some techniques to to putting them in a room uh, to help solve these problems. Uh, one thing is to never have the speaker the same distance from all the walls or the ceiling or the floor. So if your speaker is two feet from the right wall, don't have it be two feet from the front wall. Have it be maybe a foot. Play around with that. Um, big problem in rooms is most rooms are eight feet tall. And most of the time we want to have the speaker be four feet up because that's where most people's ears are. It's actually a bad place because now it's four feet from the ceiling four feet from the floor. So it's nice to try to be able to play with that. Common problem though. Because um, right. okay. I don't want it to be six feet up, just so it's an unequal distance. Can you talk about soffit mounts? So soffit mount is an older way of, of mounting speakers in a wall. Um, mm. It's a terrible idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I never do it. I never have. Uh, it, the, the problems you're trying to solve with it don't get solved, and often they create more problems. Uh, one thing is they end up having to be too high. Uh, if you look, see the slide, the, the speaker is up high because a soffit is typically a ceiling-mounted thing. It's, it's, it's a protrusion from the ceiling. Um, so people started mounting speakers in that. The problem is, it again, it puts it up high, unnatural sound stage. Um, you get reflections off of your desk, and we don't want those either. Um, plus, they get mounted in something that's not very solid, so it actually resonates, it vibrates. The speaker could actually be causing the thing it's mounted in to make sound, and we don't want that either. Um, and then sound is going to wrap around the thing sticking out. And that's the thing we're trying to solve, is we're trying to stop the sound from wrapping around the speaker. That's why we mount it in something. Um, but it doesn't solve that because, as you can see in the slide, the sound can still go underneath the speaker and bounce off the wall. We want to prevent that, and that's where flush mounting comes in. Can you explain flush mounting? It sounds like you're about to go right into that. Yeah. So flush mounting is actually putting it in the wall. We make a really heavy, heavy wall. We like it to be concrete if it can be. If not, it's going to be multiple layers of, of other things like sheetrock or plywood. Um, and it, it's actually physically mounted in there, so it's flush, as we call it, flush mount, with the wall. Um, so now we actually have to decouple it from it because we don't want to vibrate the wall along with the speaker. So we, we might put rubber pads in there. So now you have a speaker mounted in a hole that's disconnected from everything and a very heavy, heavy wall. So the wall doesn't move and the speaker doesn't want to move the wall. Um, this solves the problems of the sound wrapping around the speaker, bouncing off the wall, and mixing with what you're hearing. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So flush mounting is, the, is what soffit mounting wants to be. Ah. That's the appropriate use of it. Okay. So would flush mounting be the best possible mount solution that you could do? It's pretty much is. Okay. Um, the hardest things to control are the super low frequency stuff 
that are bouncing as a result of sound coming out of the speaker. This helps to solve that. It's, it's not the, um, the cure-all. I mean, there's still problems, um, but it's a really good start. It's, it's typically the best start you can have to putting speakers in a room. Okay. And it's rare I do it. <laughs> it's very expensive. Ah. So could you talk about trap mounts? So the trap mount is stand mount with insulation around it. So you're going to mount the speaker on a stand, as you typically would, very heavy thing with decoupling, something, you know, flexible. Um, you're going to put it in a what, what I call a fake wall. Uh, it's just insulation. And, and in the slide, you can see the, the red. All that would be insulation in this case. So we're trying to ab completely absorb everything around the speaker. Um, and then we hide it. And that's, that's the trap mount. And we're not solving everything the flush mount can because the sound is still going to wrap around the speaker, bounce off the front wall, and come forward. But at least now we have an absorber as thick as that space to try to absorb that energy. So we are going to minimize it. Um, the thing about typical stand mount is it's X amount of feet off the wall, and then there's absorption behind it. The problem is we're only absorbing partially what we need to by doing that. So by taking the absorption behind it and bringing it all the way to the face of the speaker, now we're taking advantage of all the space behind the speaker as an absorber. So I make a lot of music in my room um, at night and my parents are trying to sleep. Uh, what could I do to possibly fix that so they wouldn't be hearing it at that time? So a couple things. Mass and decoupling. Mm. Those, are, those are the two things we work with for sound isolation. And I don't like the word soundproofing. There is no such thing as soundproofing. Maybe out in space. <laughs> um, we want to isolate sound. Um, so the thing you want to do is make, make something as heavy as it can be. Weight is what's going to stop sound from passing through it. Like concrete, very, very heavy. Um, sound tends to bounce right off of it. Uh, lots of layers of sheetrock make it real heavy. The other thing is to decouple or disconnect two surfaces from each other. So you might have two walls separated by a space and you have lots of weight on one side and lots of weight on the other side. Um, that's what we're trying to accomplish. And then no holes. Mm. So doors, always a big problem. I mean it has to be a hole. Um, so we put something really heavy, we make the door really really heavy and then we put gasket systems around it. We're trying to minimize all the little cracks because all the little cracks really do matter. Uh, the smallest hole can defeat all the work you did. Um, so yes, putting door sweeps. Um, sometimes you can even get what's called a drop down threshold um, where it, when the door closes it actually drops a seal onto the floor and then when the door opens it lifts it. And there's even doors that have what's called a uh, a cam hinge. The hinge is designed so that when you swing the door open, it lifts the door. And then when you close the door, it drops it. Um, but all those things are, are what matter. So make sure there's no holes. Make sure the walls are as heavy as they can be. And then disconnect two walls from each other if possible. And there's all kinds of techniques for doing that, but that's the basics of, of what you're after. A lot of people think, well, I'll put one inch foam up, right? To, to soundproof my room doesn't do it. It has nothing to do with soundproofing the room. The foam is for the room acoustics. It's for the sound of the room, the sound inside the room, the, the echoes and the, the reverberation and all that sort of thing. It doesn't actually isolate sound. So is basically after all of the things that we've talked about today, are, um, is one inch foam kind of a gimmick in a way? Because it, I mean, we've mentioned that um, the flutter echo kind of can be solved with that. Um, but really other than that, if you're trying to be serious about really isolating sound in your studio, is it really going to do much other than that? So it's, it's not a gimmick. Okay. Um, it's just really misused. That's what happens. Um, you know, I don't know how information kind of landed that way. I mean, in the 70s, 
we used carpet in the entire room. Mm -hmm. You know, people thought that's how you soundproof a room, is you just carpet it, and it's it's far from the you know reality. Um, and then for some reason, one-inch foam came into play, and and probably because it's so inexpensive to buy, so people just buy it and they can put it up in the room, and they hear a dramatic change, because it will. It'll be a very dramatic change. Um, but you're you're not hearing things properly now, um, so it's it's not a gimmick. It just gets misused too much, but you can certainly have it in your room. Okay, so where would you use it other than the flutter uh, effect that you could solve with it? If you need um, those frequencies kind of toned down in a room, uh, maybe you've done lots of bass trapping, um, and you didn't use insulation to do it. You used say a membrane absorber, which is a hard surface. Um, with insulation behind it, and that's going to absorb low frequencies. So now you have a room, it's all hard surfaces that's doing a great job at absorbing bass. Mm. Uh, now you have to, but it might sound very live to your ears because all the high frequencies are still there. That's when you take it and you can sporadically use it to control those frequencies. So really it's to kind of fine tune things a yeah. little bit once you have the foundation set in your room. Yeah. Okay. And it's about knowing what you're trying to accomplish. And there's reasons to use it. Mm. It's just we abuse it. So um, do you have any recommendations for books or websites or anything like that that I could research by myself possibly to get my room more treated than it already is? So the Acoustic Society of America that's a good okay. place to look for acoustics. They have a website, um, and you can find information in there. Um, the Audio Engineering Society also has a website, uh, and you can find information in that. It's a way to start kind of finding your way to that, that sort of thing. Um, books, there's a lot of books out. Um, some of my favorites are by Philip Newell. Um, he's, he's in Europe somewhere. Don't know exactly where. But he has four or five books that are, they're kind of deep. They're, they're not for the uh, beginner, um, but very good books on, on all this sort of stuff. Um, the AES, I would imagine, has good resources for, you know, books in terms of control rooms, recording studios. They have lots of papers about it, too, you know, how to set up speakers and that sort of thing. Uh, so that would be a good place to go. So are there any schools that I could go to to get even more information about this topic? Uh, yes. So actually, we're lucky in New England. There's, there's quite a few places to go. Um, UMass Lowell, that's actually where I went. Um, they have a great program for sound recording and music. Um, and they, they have an acoustics class. Um, but you learn all the production, and you know, you're in the rooms and that sort of thing. Uh, same with Emerson has, has a program over there. Um, Berkeley, of course. Um, there's the Hart School of Music, uh, which is down in Connecticut. It's uh, Hartford C University. They also have an acoustics degree, so engineering. Uh, very, very well done program. Um, and then you get a little further out in uh, Penn State, as probably one of the older programs uh, for acoustics. It's pretty hardcore stuff, actually. Um, and then McGill University, which is in Montreal, in Canada. Um, they have a really good program. And you can go as far as a, a PhD. Oh, very interesting. For that kind of stuff. So pretty fortunate around here. And then many, many smaller programs. Um, NESCOM, which is up in Bangor, Maine. Oh, okay. Um, they have a, a, a nice program up there. Lou, thanks so much for coming down to Audio Builders TV. My pleasure.